Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Paul Garcia Show. I'm Paul Garcia, and today I am talking to Matt Kilgis, who is the co-owner of Kilgis Farmstead. What is Kilgis Farmstead? I'm glad you asked. It's a family-owned farm that produces and sells high-quality, farm-fresh dairy and meat products. There's a lot of reasons why this place is so special and why it's quickly become beloved in the town of Fairbury and all of central Illinois, and we'll get to that in just one second. But first, I want to give a quick shout-out to a local business that I personally love. Brands Martial Arts at 122 West Locust Street in Fairbury. This is a fantastic martial arts academy. I go here all the time, and I've been learning so much in the ways of basic striking skills and submissions. You should check this place out as well in person or on Facebook at Brands Martial Arts. This place is great, and I suggest you go there. All right, let's get on with the show. If you're watching on Facebook, be sure to hit those like and share buttons. And if you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Consider supporting the show on patreon.com forward slash Paul Garcia. And you can donate to the show using Venmo or PayPal at the Paul Garcia show. I appreciate it a lot. And now without further ado, here's me and Mr. Matt Kilgis. Matt Kilgis, thank you so much for coming on. Well, thanks for having me today. It is my pleasure. This is a big one, man. You own one of the most beloved businesses here in central Illinois, definitely in Fairbury. And upon my research, I came to understand that you are probably the nicest human being on the planet. And <laughs> I'm very curious as to how that is because you're undoubtedly super busy from running Kilgus, from doing actual farm work and the business work, and you're also a husband and a father. So what's your secret? How do you remain so friendly? Why aren't you a total grouch? <laughs> well, don't ask my wife, maybe, but... Uh, <laughs> um, no, our operation, uh, we do have a lot going from the grain farming to the milk bottling and the meat business and so forth, but um, I'm just one of several that are involved in the operation. Um, I'm uh, in business with my Uncle Paul and uh, his wife, Carmen, and as I mentioned, myself and my wife, Jenna, and then um, my uncle's two boys, which my first cousins are involved in the operation too. Um, Trent and his wife Kayla and Justin and his wife Kaylee. So there's Sheesh. there's uh, four four families, Kilgus families that are involved in the operation as well as our hired uh, help too. Wow, that's kind of incredible. So is this thing family owned through and through? Like are all the employees and all the people making decisions Kilgus's? Um, so that's the core of us, but we do have some very uh, key employees in the business also. Um, we've got um, a, a girl that milks full-time for us. She helps on the dairy operation side. And, um, and then we have um, one gentleman that helps with, uh, mainly runs all their delivery routes for us and so forth. So he does a great job at that, keeping things uh, in line on that. And then we... Um, we have another full-time employee that helps both with the milk bottling and on the farm side and kind of juggles back and forth. So definitely there's a lot of Kilgus's involved, but there's definitely a lot of key employees to keep everything going also. How about we take a step back real quick and let people who haven't maybe been to Kilgus or maybe don't know Kilgus, let them know what exactly it is that you guys do. Sure. So um, just a little history going back. My grandfather started the family dairy farm back in the 1950s, um, started with about a dozen Holstein cows. And uh, that grew over time and, um, and then evolved into um, my uncle and my dad in partnership um, running the operation. And then um, when I was in high school, uh, I guess we can say 20 some years ago now. Um, <laughs> that's hard to believe. You don't you don't look like you're about to turn 40, man. You look nearly my age. So. Well, that's what I say all the time too. I can't believe it either. But a lot of days I feel like it. But um, um, and so when I was in high school, my father um, got leukemia and passed away, and then that kind of evolved into where I stepped into the operation with my uncle um, as I was finishing high school and going to college. So you were involved in the business like in a big way from a young age. Yes. Yep. Wow. I uh, um, was able to. Uh, Unfortunately, not the way I wanted to get into course, farming, right. but um, just the way it happened. And then uh, I was able to to go to Joliet Junior College and, and uh, commute back and forth with a few other guys from here and still help with the operation. So that's how it kind of evolved 
in the early 2000s into my uncle Paul and myself in the operation. Um, and then uh, his boys had an interest in coming back to the farm. And at that time, it was only, you know, enough to, to honestly support about a family and a half. It was kind of hard to get even myself fully into the operation. And so we were we started trying to think outside of the box. You know, what could we do um, just to go out and magically farm more acreage or um, you know, double or triple your herd size on the, the dairy just didn't seem logical and, and really um, is not possible in most situations. So we started to look at, okay, we're producing this milk product and, you know, what could we do to add value to it and yet diversify our operation? And so that's when we started looking around and we thought about going down the avenue of making cheese out of our milk, um, explored that a little bit. And there was some other operations, um, uh, like the ROPS down by Bloomington Normal that had just started in making a Jersey cheese. And we didn't want to really, you know, step on anybody's toes and compete. Right. And uh, then we started looking around and said, hey, you know what? There's nobody else that's doing a fluid milk, um, just what is bottling fluid, fluid milk? milk. So it's just, uh, you know, basically you go to the store and you you buy a gallon of whole or 2% or skim milk. So basically just taking that milk in that fluid form and... Um, you know, making a product and not not taking it and making like a yogurt or a cheese or you mm. know something like that. So, so we started doing our research. Um, it was probably 2007, and uh, when we really got serious about, uh, we went to other states. When we realized there's nobody else in Illinois doing this, we had to travel to Wisconsin and Iowa, um, different places, other families that were. We're doing this already, and of course, um, probably anybody that's uh, started a business, you look at somebody else that's maybe been doing it for ten years and think, "Oh yeah, that looks uh, looks uh, pretty manageable. I could handle that." And, right. Uh, <laughs> and then, um, then reality hits. But you know, we we kind of got to the point where we did all the research and said, "Hey, you know, we think we could we could make this go in a step we want to take." And um, you, you thought you could bottle your own milk? Is yeah. that basically what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, basically, and, and have a market for it. Um, we did a little bit of research, talked to um, you know some different stores in the area, Bloomington, Peoria, Champaign, and a uh, little bit up in Chicago at that point. And of course, you know the stores. Um, you know, at that time, we're looking for ways that, um, you know, what ways can we stand out and be different and keep our small stores going as opposed to, you know, kind of the way things go to, to bigger stores, a one stop shop. Yeah. And, um, you know, so there was interest there. And of course, the store can say, well, yeah, we think we would sell 200 gallon of your milk each week. And, you know, at the end of the day, if they only sell 30 gallon a week, that's all they're going to order. So obviously there's a risk there, but there was interest there. So we kind of, at that point, we just took the leap and, um, and basically started, re, um, you know, getting equipment in, building on to our operation and, and, um, that's time to where to June of 09 is when we actually bottled our first milk here at Kilgus Farmstead. Wow. And and so I didn't realize how rare of a thing that is. Um, are, I don't think there's any farms in central Illinois right now that, that are bottling and putting on shelves their, the milk that they produce there at their farm. Do most farms that have dairy cows, does someone like Prairie Farms <laughs> or something like that come in and take that milk and do the whole process with it and put it in their jugs? Yes. Okay. So, so in general, that's um, that is how things work. You know, as as dairy farmers, we were part of a co-op. Um, you know, where they just come pick your milk up and and obviously do the processing like we're doing here, but then they you know do sales and distribution. Um, you know, which to feed the world, that's largely how things have to run. Of course. Yeah. Um, but you know, I guess the way we looked at it was we were adding another step. Um, controlling our product from the time a calf's born till a cow starts giving milk till uh, we put it in the jug and take it to the end consumer. So, you know, adding some more steps in there, we thought, hey, this is a way we can um, add diversification to our operation and bring more family members back into the operation. You control the whole thing from start to finish. That is really cool. Correct. Correct. And something else that makes you stand out is is your milk itself. Talk about the thing that you do that that most milk producers don't do. Sure. So as we um, 
you know, tried to decide how are we going to launch this product? How are we going to, you know, make it different from what else is on the store shelf? And, you know, if I remember back to when we started, um, you had a lot of milk that was maybe a dollar ninety nine on the shelf, and and obviously for an investment of a small farm like ours, we can't go sell milk for a dollar ninety nine on the shelf. So then we say, okay, if our milk's two ninety nine or three ninety nine on the shelf, how is it different from the milk sitting there that's a dollar ninety nine? So we have to be able to sell our product. Obviously, yeah. people aren't going to buy it at a higher price for no good reason. Yes, yes. So that's why we looked at, okay, what can we do to make our product different? Um, and I guess the first thing I'll start with is uh, we milk all Jersey cows, and that was the first way we wanted to differentiate ourselves. What's so, the big deal there? So with the Jersey cows. Um, they are, you know, your common cow is your black and white, your Holsteins. They give the most milk. Um, and the Jersey gives actually, which is closer to the least amount of milk, but it's a, it's a more nutrient dense milk. It's higher in protein Ooh. and calcium. Um, we've, we had some research done initially when we started that showed that when we would pull, you know, brand X off the shelf and, um, we had a lab do some testing and it, and it did show the difference in that. So therefore that it's going to give the milk more body and flavor. And a lot of people say our skim will taste like, um, your, your 2% that you, of brand X that you would get off the shelf. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was one way we wanted to use the Jersey cow to help, um, um, set our, our self apart on the store shelf. And then the other big um, step we took when we did our research, we found that there was a lot, the markets we were targeting, there was a lot looking at wanting non homogenized milk. And so, what this means when you homogenize the milk, you're taking the pat, fat particles and you're breaking them down and destroying them into real small pieces and therefore when you buy a gallon of milk on the shelf that fat is evenly distributed within that gallon of two percent milk mm -hmm. um, so what we did is we chose to leave that fat whole it's one less mechanical process that you're doing to that milk um, but then what, like in our two percent in our whole as it sits that cream is going to rise to the top and um, as it sits, it gets that cream line. And so you do have to shake it up um, to get it evenly distributed back in. Now, that cream line's not for everybody. A lot of the um, older generations remember cream line milk. Um, <laughs> a lot of people my age, your age, don't remember that. So um, they're not always um, maybe intrigued by the cream line milk. But I guess the good thing with our product is then we've got the skim milk that the, the fat is taken out of. So there is no cream line on it. So what we've had is a lot of people that maybe were used to drinking 2% and maybe didn't care for the cream line have switched to our skim. And because of the Jersey mm. cow giving it more body and flavor um that's where they say i don't notice any difference from the two percent milk i used to drink yeah and i'm willing to bet that a lot of people who don't prefer the the fat line at the top of the milk when they buy from you know, like your two percent and stuff like that they just don't know why that's there they think it's it's bad right right yeah and and you know um this was a real learning curve for us when we first started just just realizing um you know you you can go to the store and buy so many products, but um, you know it's it's hard to be educated on everything you buy. So right. your general person um, going into Dave's supermarket grabs our milk and sees cream on the top. Uh, you know when we first started, didn't realize even what a cream line milk was and so forth. Yeah, it's so, supposed yeah, to be. It there. was just a, you know it was a it was a learning curve to educate people on it. And now it says shake well, and that pretty well does the trick. And then it's going to disperse that fat anyway. So yes, it's yes. just kind of funny that people don't know that hey that's normal. And yeah. it's actually it's less processed. That's got to be desirable for people. Your milk is is one. It has one less step in processing. So it's a more whole and wholesome, you know, type of milk. Yeah. And that was our, you know, our definitely our goal in doing this was just what's the least amount of mechanical process we can do to it. And, um, you know, of course, you want to you want to be able to sell to everybody and, and hope they understand. But, um, you know that was just a, it was enough different that some people it took a while to understand you know what the difference was and i feel like you know now um 
you know, since 09, um, you know, we've we've educated people and, um, you know, if the cream line something they don't care for, they've made the switch to our skim and so forth. But uh, but yeah, it did take some initial education. This show is sponsored by Iroquois Farmers State Bank. If you're a farmer, you likely understand the frustration that comes with dealing with banks that don't understand the financial aspects of farming or farming in general. And that's why you need to be doing your banking with Iroquois Farmers State Bank. This bank prides itself on its relationships with farmers, and it has been for over 100 years. Their current ag loan lender is Zach Meister, and he understands the financial aspects of farming because he grew up immersed in the farming community of Fairbury, Illinois. For all your farming financial needs, from operating lines to farmland loans, you need to call up Iroquois Farmers State Bank at 815 815- 265-4707. Serving farmers for over 100 years. That's a century. Iroquois Farmers State Bank. Let them know that the Paul Garcia Show sent you. Something that we spoke about before we hit record on this was that you actually offer a straight up raw milk. Is that right? Like at your own store. You don't put it on shelves at, at Dave's or any other places, but you can. I could go over there to your store on your farm and buy some whole milk, like not whole milk, raw milk, right? Yep. yep. Yeah. So this is something, um, and it's always uh, a hot button topic. Obviously you want to make sure raw milk, any type of milk is safe for people to drink. And in the last couple of years, um, the state of Illinois has, uh, you know, had changed some rules to where we are, we're a, a legal grade A dairy farm, and we can legally put that raw milk in a jug, mm. um, have the proper labeling on it, and have it for sale in our store. Um, now, you know, we don't take it out. We don't distribute it anywhere, but legally we can have it in our store, and um, folks can come out and buy it. And um, that's been something uh, that we – have been doing for about oh eight months now we kind of uh started slow into it we were a little hesitant but we um it was something that has really caught on and and we're probably moving you know 60 to 80 gallon out of our store of that and usually when people try that um it's it's kind of hard to explain it's just a lot sweeter tasting and um since there is no mechan it doesn't go through the pasteurization process or anything so there's no mechanical process on it like your cream line shakes up a lot easier and so forth and um i will say locally most people that say i'm going to take a gallon of raw milk home and try it um not only do they love it their kids love it and um and they continue to come back for it so that is continually you know slowly growing and um you know like I say, we, we do the best to, to keep it safe and healthy, and it's tested just like our other milk. Um, realize the raw is not for everybody, but it uh, you know legally we have that option to offer it now to our, our local customers. That is so cool. I love that whole idea. That I just love the, the fact that you guys are doing that when probably not a lot of other milk producers are doing anything like that because it's, it's risky, but I admire that a lot. Yeah, and you know... Um, and understandably so, um, you know, you have certain guidelines if you're a regular, um, you know, dairy farmer that's selling to a co-op, they don't have the opportunity like we do when we control our product to the end user. That allows us to be able to put it out here. Um, and so because of our unique situation, we're our own processor, um, mm-hmm. you know, we're able to offer that option. So it's just a nice fit for what we're doing. Any business owner, any successful business owner knows that marketing is almost everything when it comes to generating sales, generating fans of your business. So I want to ask, how has that journey been for Kilgus Farmstead? How have you guys improved your marketing and made decisions about marketing and stuff? What has that been like and what have you found that people like about your advertising and marketing and stuff and what they don't like. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's been a it's been a learning experience, honestly, because um, you know, this bottling our own milk and selling to consumers was something we had never thought of earlier on. And it's just a whole different perspective when you're not just the farmer, you're you're going out, you're doing the marketing, so to speak. That's a whole nother hat you have to wear now. Yeah. Yeah. And so you know, here we are launching this new brand 
we put a jug of Kilgus Farmstead milk on the shelf and people don't know, well, okay, what's, I don't know anything about it, right, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. so yeah, the marketing virtually had to start from ground up of, of starting a new, new product. And, um, what we did initially was we'd go out and we'd stand there and we'd sample milk and talk about our product as, as the moms would come through, you know, buying, buying milk for mm-hmm. their family and so forth. And, and it gave us a chance to tell our story right there to them. Um, and of course, um, as we talked about earlier with a hundred things going, you know, that's okay for a while, but you don't want to be 10 years later having to stand at the oh, store right, doing, right. Um, doing that. And so it took a little while to get the ball rolling. And then, you know, we had some, um, newspaper articles come out and, uh, you know, had a champagne um, newspaper come out, did a story on us and it was in the Sunday paper. Well, that next week we had three more stores call us down in champagne. We had the same thing in Peoria. Oh. And then that kind of really got the ball rolling for us. Um, you know, and then there was a time, you know, we were obviously looking for stores and then we kind of built up to where sales were good enough. We just let um um let people kind of come to us once they heard about us you know and we we honestly weren't putting a ton into marketing for a time there we've always taken the opportunity um you know locally um to put stuff out um, whether it be in the local paper or you know take an opportunity to advertise for an event or be a part of event um an event you know and and kind of went about it that way and then kind of you know our our chicago marketing was a little bit of a slower start until we had i'm not surprised a big city coming and like you guys are used to operating in a small town farm town area yeah Yeah, i imagine that'd be tough to market up in chicago yeah and and, you know and then one day we had a distributor um we were about oh i don't know three months into our processing we had a distributor reach out to us from up there said hey we deal in, in local farm products we were told about your milk we'd love to take you on um, and so that was huge for us because we went up and drove around Chicago a little bit and you don't, you don't even know where to start marketing there, yeah. you know? Um, and then once we were able to get hooked in with somebody, um, you know, they were able to kind of make those connections for us. And then, you know, I went up there a few times and did some demoing in some stores. And then we, we, they had a person that demoed for, um, our, our distributor did, they would demo the distributor's product. And so then they would start demoing our milk. And, 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 you know, we just found with what we were doing with the, with the dairy side of it, it was just, it was about getting in front of the consumers and telling, telling your story. Um, again, going to back to why should I pay another dollar or two a gallon for your milk? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that's good marketing advice for any business owner or any business for that matter, I would say. You got to get out there, tell your story, tell, just get in front of people, like you said. A lot that led us to doing what we're doing today, too, was it was kind of a time where there was a movement where people were kind of going back to wanting to know where their food was coming from. Mm -hmm. And so what we found is consumers were eager to hear that story, um, you know, once we got out there and it was just committing the time and the you know, not all, sometimes we had to draw straws. Well, who wants to go to the store on Friday night from six to nine to demo, you know, but, um, but that's, that's what it's about. And you consider the Chicago and culture. I think they're really big on, you know, or organic and are, you know, just kind of the, I don't even know what to call it. I want to say the hippie food movement. They want to know where the food comes from, how you treating the animals, you know, all this good stuff. And when I look at your place, I imagine that they're kind of pleased with what Kilgus is about. You treat your cows here very well. You know, I guess kind of what makes our product unique too is in the summertime from April till November, the cows are out and, and grazing in the pastures. I'll um, ride my bike and, by uh, here. And those are some happy cows and you can't deny that. It is, it's great seeing them just out and about. It, yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I guess one of the things um, that kind of made me think when you brought up our farm, mm-hmm. you know, one of our other marketing points was, well, do we want to, you know, we, we talked about, do we want to go fully organic? Do we want to, you know, what, what route do we want to take there? And Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, kind of where we were at, um, and, and the story we would tell to those moms that were coming through buying the milk is, you know, we're not organic. Um, we want to use an antibiotic in a, in a proper way, not over abuse it, but we referred to it as like, 
my kids. If, if one of my kids is sick, <laughs> do I want to be able to use the proper antibiotic? I don't want to give them too much, but do I want to make them better, make them feel of better? Of course, right. And that's, you know, that's how we view our animals is, um, it seems like a lot of days we spend more time with the animals than we do our own kids. <laughs> but, um, you know, if people let, listen to your story um, about that, you know, we're just wanting to the best life possible for those cows. Um, and then, so they understand that. And, um, and we've went down the route of non GMO feeds. We grow our feeds here, but, um, you know, we feel that that's a better digestibility for the cows and so forth. And so all the, all the corn products and so forth that go into the cows, we've, we've kept it non GMO and, and that's on our marketing side and, and all the stores, the health food stores and so forth are on board with that, you know, um, the whole local thing and that they can come out here and see how you treat your animals and so forth kind of trumps the organic um, oh, side of it, it as it should as it should that's the coolest part in my opinion i love that about you guys i mean i remember coming out here and having field trips when i was a kid there are no secrets you can walk around and see absolutely everything that you do versus you know maybe a, a bigger you know mega milk distributor or producer they might do who knows? They might do sketchy stuff and not let anyone tour that that part of the building. I don't know. And before I continue, I want to say I'm a moron when it comes to uh, farming <laughs> and the milk industry. I don't know anything. But I've talked to a lot of farmers. A good amount of them say that, one, non-GMO is kind of an interesting thing in itself. Like, GMOs are not a bad thing a lot of the time. Right. And that organic, it's like a highlight term. It's, it's a buzzword. And a lot of the times what you you would prefer non-organic over organic if you knew exactly what they both entailed and stuff. What do you think about that? Are organic and non-GMO, are they extremely important or or what? You know, um, the, the nice thing is, is there's such a, you know, you can be clear 100% organic, um, you can be in the non-GMO markets, or you can be full-fledged using every bit of technology that uh, has been given to us. And, um, you know, I think all those products are, are safe or they wouldn't be out on the market. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but the nice thing is if, if I wanted to produce organic corn or soybeans, I would have a market for it. Um, we, we market, um, you know, our non-GMO corn and our non-GMO soybeans, the, you know, the stuff the acres that don't go to feed the cows, um, we market that uh, to a, a specialty market and get a premium for it. And so, you know, there's a market for that. And, um, you know, on up to the to the latest and greatest technology, which, you know, which we use too on, on some of our acres. And, um, you know, so I think that is the nice thing. There's, um, we're not all, um, there's freedom of choice there. And, um, you know, what goes into organic farming um, takes a lot of, you know, there's a lot more into it, but there's a, a higher reward at the end as far as the price and so forth. So, you know, I, I'm personally not scared of the, like I say, the latest and greatest technologies and, and seeds and so forth and, um, you know, growing those types of crops. But, um, you know, if there's a consumer that wants to go out there and buy something that says, you know, non-GMO on it, that's, you know, their option. And, and you know, they're going to pay a little more. And if they want organic, you know, they're going to pay a little more, too. So that's um, that's kind of the way I look at it. It's, it's just sure. a nice uh, just a nice, uh, you know, whole scheme of things for farmers. Is it true that corn, as we know it today, is a byproduct of genetic modification? Like that's what I've heard. Like when it comes to GMOs. If, if we didn't have GMOs and corn would still be like three inches big or so, they'd be like so small and stuff. Is that true? Or is that baloney? <laughs> you know, I think um, I'm not a, an expert in it. I think things have evolved over time. Just like everything, there's breeding, you know, they're breeding these different hybrids. But when we're talking the GMO, that's when they're actually inserting these different genes into those, oh. you know, to do whether it's, uh, you know, to be resistant to a chemical or so forth. So um, and those types of things or a certain insect they could be resistant to where, you know, when we're buying the, the non GMO seed, that is a, a true conventional seed that has no genetic modification to it, um, you know, and then and then we grow it from there for the feed. So oh, definitely the breeding has gotten better with the genetics. Um, otherwise, you know, we wouldn't be looking at, you know, raising 250 bushel corn. We would still be looking at raising, you know, 
50 bushel or 70 bushel corn. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of things that have evolved in the, in the breeding of the, of the plants to get us to where we are today. Got it. So it sounds like from the beginning of Kilgus Farmstead, it's kind of been an upward trend. I want to ask if there's ever been a dip in the road, you know, have you ever hit a bump in the road or had a big downfall with Kilgus just as in the business sense or in the farming sense? Have you had any real issues? Well, I guess funny you ask. It's, you know, honestly, since we bought started bottling in 09, we grew from selling. Well, I think those first months there, you know, we were talking hundreds of gallons, you know, to up to where we are Um we're not at our peak today. I'll get into that in a minute. But, you know, at our peak, we were doing 6,500 gallon roughly a week. Um, now, since 09, of course, um, you have the, the hardships of starting a business and, and learning, um, you know, those first six months of business. Um, if I had to relive those, I don't honestly know if I'd go back and relive yeah. that well, six months. Why but, was that? Uh, Tell me about how was it stressful? What was that like? Yeah, just, you know. I guess one of our big decisions in doing this whole thing was once we started doing it, and I, t I totally understand, but the co-op we were a part of said, you know, totally respect you guys want to bottle your own milk, but once you start, we're not going to take any extra milk, you know, um, and, and help you out till you get on your feet. So we had to, you know, go from shipping milk, um, you know, to a co-op one day to selling it you know, what we could in, in the Kilgus jugs the next day. So, you know, of course. Dang, right out we, of the gate, we yeah, had some difficulty. We, we cut our herd back to like, uh, you know, I think it was 60 or 70 cows. And I think those first couple of weeks we were selling milk of, out of about 30 cows. So we had a lot of extra. And, and, you know, just learning all that equipment and trying to get everything going. Oh, my and, gosh. Uh, <laughs> six months, it just you know, trying to get everything figured out and then having problems with the product. And we didn't know what was wrong because we, you know, just weren't versed in it and, and mm -hmm. didn't know, didn't have the knowledge. So, you know, I guess that's why I say it was just, uh, and again, I'm, I'm sure anybody that started a business to an extent when it's something new like that, you, everybody goes through those struggles, but, um, you know, just looking back, that was just a very stressful time and, and getting going. But once we, once we got out of there, you know, we just kind of kept inching up and, you know, our initial goal was to sell 3000 gallon a week. Well, I don't remember if it was a couple years, we, we hit that point. Um, and then we just said, okay, well, the market's there and we kept growing. And, and again, to, you know, probably, uh, the last several years we've been at that you know 6500 gallon uh roughly uh we milk about 150 cows um but then march hit and uh and march covid this year. yeah covid hit um and then uh we mentioned any bumps in the roads or downturns um that's where we really um you know all of a sudden we were cruising along and all of a sudden things are closing down and and uh, you know, i mentioned before about uh, our market in chicago we've built up to where about half of our milk was going to chicago holy moly and um That's, you know wow and then all of a sudden the middle of march our distributor calls and and they typically pick up an order on monday and he's calling me on sunday saying hey um i don't think we're going to need to even come down for an order you know everything is closing up and it's just like oh man what do we do this show is sponsored by Fairberry Furniture. If you're sitting in anything other than furniture from Fairberry Furniture, then you are missing out. Fairberry Furniture sells tons of the comfiest, most gorgeous, and most beloved brands of chairs, couches, beds, and tables. Their store is huge and their selection is supreme. They've got loads of five-star reviews because they are Central Illinois' premier furniture supplier. Everyone loves this place and so will you. So when you finally decide you deserve to live in a comfortable and beautiful home, head to Fairberry Furniture in, of course, Fairberry, Illinois. Rick owns this place and I know him well and he is fantastic. Fairberry Furniture. Let them know that the Paul Garcia show sent you. Um, so that was definitely a bump in the road. And, uh, you know, these last nine, 10 months, um, you know, after those first few months, we kind of hit some stabilization. And then, um, 
you know, things are slowly going back up, but we're, we're not to where we were at. And, and a lot has had to change in our operation to make things go. Really quick, just before we go on, I want to ask about Chicago. Where does most of your milk go up there? Is it to grocery stores or is it to something else? So, you know, um, and this was one disadvantage when COVID hit. We had, we had built a market and something that we didn't know even existed there was such a demand was for the coffee shops. Um, oh, yeah. I just we, did an episode with April Fritz, and she said that the coffee world goes crazy for specifically Kilgus's 5% super milk. Yes. That is so cool. I was, yes. I was blown away when she told me that. Uh, and uh, so, any, but yeah, if you come and get our raw milk, that is 5%. So you get the super stuff. But oh, um, heck yeah. Um, no, so it. Uh, you know, the, the market built, and I'm guessing, um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but probably two thirds of our milk goes to coffee shops. Um, and then we were taking a large portion of like cream and some fluid milk to restaurants. Um, and, and then the other portion makes up the retail side of it. So we were, we were really heavy on, you know, coffee shops and uh, restaurants and so forth. So obviously when COVID hit, um, what were the first things to shut down, you know, restaurants, Um, coffee shops. Yes. And, um, and then of course the grocery stores all of a sudden couldn't keep up with demand and they were running out. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, so that gave us a little opportunity to shift a little bit, uh, to some grocery stores that weren't able to get, uh, milk because the bigger co-ops just were, you know, they were getting it there, but it just took several days because they were so far behind. Mm -hmm. And, um, so we did, you know, diversify out a little bit, got into some more retail shops, um, stores, and uh, were able to move some like that. Um, and, and, you know, downstate, uh, I, I will say, uh, you know, you'd mentioned the coffee hound there, you know, a lot of those did great at doing curbside and, and other things. And, and um, you know, I, I get it in Chicago, just with, with the dense amount of people there and stuff. Some were just forced to shut the doors for, Oh, I forgot you know, about that. Of a course. long time. And, yeah. um, and so we're, you know, the Chicago market, I would say we are probably between half, well, we're probably getting close to two thirds of what it was. Um, you know, but a long time we were running 30%, 25%. So it, it definitely is getting back there, but well, it's been a long, hear, a long road. Um, so that, you know, but we just, we had to really shift and we're doing some actually putting some milk and some home delivery stuff. Like in Bloomington Normal, there's a, a home delivery hub we're delivering down there. Um getting into some other things. There's some folks that's taking our milk and making yogurt out of it. And we're kind of co-marketing that with them and just some things that, uh, you know, a year ago we didn't intend to do, but, uh, like the world is right now, I guess in about every person would say they're doing stuff different than what they intended to a year ago. That's right. And good businesses and good business owners adapt and overcome, you know, you make with what you got, you play the cards you're dealt. Yeah. So yeah, good to hear you guys are getting better, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I guess something I haven't mentioned was the, you know, in this also that the milk really went down, but we do have the meat side of the business that, uh, with the beef and the pork and so forth. And that kind of exploded, um, since COVID, since COVID just with people, (laughs) uh, you know, again, a lot of those larger, um, processing plants, uh, you know, I guess, unfortunately just had the COVID run through to where they had to you know, scale way back on processing or whatever. And, um, you know, uh, it uh, gave an opportunity for our little store out here to be pretty busy with, uh, you know, with meat sales and so forth. And did you guys have to just skyrocket your prices or did you say relatively the same? No, we were able to, you know, keep them the same. And, and the hard part was just, um, you know, the, the local processors were so overrun with with people wanting to get their meat processed and so forth that uh, but you know thank goodness we were able to to keep our freezers pretty well stocked and and keep um, you know keep things going but uh, you know I'll, I'll never forget probably that first month of things or whatever we actually had um, you know typically our stores self checkout you go check out yourself and which is really cool I can't <laughs> believe we didn't mention that and, yeah uh, you guys you're you're your storefront you have all your products there and no one's in there as a cashier there's a money box and it's a trust system right right like you come in with a twenty dollar bill and then you buy a five dollar thing of milk or whatever you put the 20 in then you have to take fifteen dollars out three fives out of that money box 
it's really crazy. And it just is kind of a testament to the culture that we have here where you can trust people. Yeah, right. You know? Right. But anyways. <laughs> yeah. No. And so, you know, we were doing that to all of a sudden when COVID hit and we just, um, you know, just got not overran, but I mean, all of a sudden it's like we couldn't keep, you know, it could took a couple people busy in the store and we, there was actually a time we were running two checkout lines in our little store. Um, wow. You know, and it's just, I still looking back on it, it's just, um, you know, baffles me that, that it was that busy. Um, you know, we're now, we're kind of in the dead of winter and, um, our, our, our traffic, our foot traffic is still up, no doubt since, you know, from a year ago and we're selling more product and so forth. But, um, you know, I think, uh, something that really impressed me um, through this whole COVID thing and through the struggles is um, even like our local sales at Dave's supermarket on our milk and so forth, you know, have, have really went up and they've stayed up. And, and I think a, a, just a testament to, like you mentioned, the local people and even the foot traffic in our store, I think people were concerned, you know, not only for us, but all the small businesses um, in town that, you know, they could keep keep going, keep the doors open and so forth. And so, um, you know, I guess I'm really proud of the community, how they've stepped up, not only to support us, but I, I know several other businesses locally that have, have seen that support from, from Fairbury. Me and Lincoln Slagle, who owns uh, Emancipation Brewery in Fairbury, we've talked about that in one of these episodes. Like, it's just incredible. The I don't even know what to call it. The morale here in Fairbury. People support local. People are just plain old nice. They're willing to help out local businesses. They're willing to help help out just individuals too. And I think it's it has to do with the strong Christian foundation of this area. But it could be a whole host of different things. But it's it's definitely I'm very proud to be from Fairbury as well. Yeah. And just from this area. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's really nice to hear that they came and came through for you guys and yes. stuff. Yes. Just curious. Are the majority of your sales uh, dairy sales? You know, in the whole scope of things, um, we do move a lot of gallons of milk a week, but the, the the meat side of it, the you know, mainly the beef and the pork has really, you know, really grown. And, um, you know, we've started some different things in the last couple of years, like flavored brats and so forth. And it used to be, um, you know, people you know, would come out here if they were out this way to grab their gallon of milk or whatever. But, you know, obviously if they're in at Dave's getting other things, they're probably going to go grab their gallon of milk, which is great, you know. But, um, you know, since our meat side of it has expanded a little more in our store, um, you know, we get people out more say, hey, I'm going to buy, a you know, a package of flavored brats or a steak for tonight, whatever, and then I'll grab my milk. But I would say, you know, in the whole scope of things, um, not only do we sell, you know, the, the pieces of meat in here, we'll sell, you know, to restaurants and butcher other butcher shops and so forth. So in the scheme of things, really, when you're talking gross dollars, our meat business is, is just as big as the dairy side of it as mm. well. This episode is sponsored by PSF Legacy Jiu-Jitsu in Normal, Illinois. PSF Legacy Jiu-Jitsu helps people like you and me develop extreme discipline, mental and physical toughness, and elite level combative and defensive techniques. Learn submissions, learn takedowns, and learn what to do when a fight hits the ground, and all while getting in the best shape of your life at PSF Legacy Jiu-Jitsu in Normal, Illinois. Absolutely anyone can enroll here. It's so welcoming, the education is great, and the owner, Jared Game, is the man. Jiu-Jitsu is fun, intense, promotes good health, and builds confidence. It's about time you learn how to do it. Shoot them a message on Facebook at PSF Legacy Jiu Jitsu and they'll take it from there. PSF Legacy Jiu Jitsu. Let them know that the Paul Garcia show sent you. We've talked about some of the, the bumps in the road that you've had with this business. I want to ask now, what's your favorite part about running Kilgis Farmstead? What's the best thing about doing what you do? You know, I think, uh, I think it's uh, very rewarding when, um, you know, when when you're getting that feedback direct from consumers. Um, you know, we might be somewhere, um, 
and we've had other people, um, relatives with the last name Kilgus that'll say, Hey, I was in Chicago. And you know, somebody says, Kilgus, are you the one that sells the dairy and meat products, you know, or something like that. And, um, you know, just to, just to get the feedback direct from the consumers, I think that's probably the most rewarding, um, part of it. It just to know that you're producing a quality product that, you know, that people enjoy and, um, like everything, of course, you know, there's going to be, uh, you know, constructive criticism too, but it's, uh, you know, which we appreciate just as much, but just to get that feedback in general and, and you know, not even, um, you know, like our, our little store here, just, we do have families that come down from Chicago, you know, say, Hey, we like our, your product so much. We make this a once a month trip to come down here or, um, you know, something that amazes me is just, uh, um, just being south of the racetrack here when, when, uh, when they have their big races and the people that come from across the country that once they come out and you, you know, I just, I haven't mentioned the ice cream yet, but they'll come out for ice cream and they'll stock up on their meat to go camping and so forth. And just, to, you know, just to see those repeat customers and, um, you know, especially out here and meet somebody from a state away or something or across the country that, uh, says, Hey, you know, we, every year we come back to the races, we're going to come back out here and, and, and they do. And to see those people year after year. And so I think that's, you know, the, the way it's evolved and, and just getting, getting direct to the consumers is, is the most rewarding. What's your average day like? What, what's a normal day for you? You live right across the street from Kilgus. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> so you never really get a break. You can't go home and totally separate from the business because you just walk out your front door and you see the business, the massive farm that you have. Can't have a snow day when you can walk across oh, the road. Oh, that's funny. That's <laughs> right. But no, I mean, like all livestock farmers, you know, you, um, it's seven days a week. And that's a nice thing. There's a lot of family involved. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in general, we process our milk on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And those days, and my cousin myself, my cousin, Justin, and a couple of our employees, you know, we start about 4 a.m. We're processing the milk. 4 a.m., um, huh? Yes. Holy cow. <laughs> what time do you go to bed? Uh, like eight? As soon as I sit down on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, man, this is not an easy uh, job. Um, no, That's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a lifestyle and, and people say, well, why, why would you want to do that? You know, but I, I, I'm sure every job has that, but you know, it's, uh, you know, not every job is where, you know, my kids, they're to the age now they can come over and work with me. You know, they, they like to get up on the weekends and help with the weekend chores. And, um, you know, if, if I need to run home for something, I can, you know, and, and, um, you know, we try to rotate our weekend chores and we, a couple families each do them, you know, a Saturday or Sunday night. So we get a little time off, but, you know, we go out as a family and do it. So, you know, I think farming in general, um, you know, is, is that's the rewarding side of it. You can do it with your family. And, um, you know, I think it's, I grew up doing it and I think it's great for my kids that, uh, they're not sitting here, uh, playing video games or something. And, uh, right. we get them out there right. and work and, um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, the hours are long and, uh, you know, there's sure there's times like <laughs> Christmas morning, you think, ah, oh, I just wish the cows would take a day off, but, uh, you know, that's all, that's all comes with the territory and, and to produce the food and, and do the livestock. That's um, all part of it. But again, I think we're fortunate to have an operation where we have several employees, several family members involved, because I, I think back to the stories of, uh, you know, people, my grandparents age, they'll say, well, we never took a vacation in 40 years. You know, I didn't have anybody else to milk the cows and so forth. So I think, um, you know, I, I look at that situation and, and I think we're fortunate to be able to still, still get away, be involved in other activities. And, uh, you know, the, our kids are in sports, so, you know, we can, we can get off and go to a game and, and so forth. So, um, no, we are tied down more than sometimes I want to yeah, be, but, yeah. uh, but, you know, I think, um, there's still plenty we can we can do that uh, you know maybe the people in other situations couldn't. I have immense respect for people like you that do what you do. The farm life is not an easy life, but it is definitely rewarding in a lot of ways. Yeah, Matt, it's been a pleasure talking. We'll go ahead and wrap this thing up in just a second. But is there anything else you'd like to say before we do so? 
Uh, I think, uh, you know, anybody locally here listening to this, or if you're not local, you ever get out here south of Fairbury, come on, uh, come on out. And um, the ice cream is always a big hit, especially in the summertime. A lot of, so lot of good. bikers and, uh, and golf carts like to come out and, um, you know, spend the evening on the patio, eat some ice cream. And, uh, you know, um, we don't have a ton of products in our store, but just a lot of a lot of little things and uh we'd love to have you out and uh hopefully this year we can get back to uh my wife jenna does the touring side of it and if there's ever any interest um we pretty much took all this last year off of tours because of covid but we're hoping we can get back to to doing that and some of our farm events too so um you know hopefully looking into 2021 it's a more gets to normal by summer and uh and just stop out and see us we'd love to show you the farm Right on. Matt Kilgis, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. And all great things must come to an end. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it on Facebook, Instagram, or any social media platform and send it to your friends. And if you're listening on a podcast platform, please feel free to leave us a solid review. Be sure to check out the show's sponsors. And if you enjoy the Paul Garcia show as a whole, I would absolutely love it if you would become an exclusive member for just $4.99 on patreon.com forward slash Paul Garcia. You'll get access to full video episodes and exclusive clips from each episode and even an exclusive episode each month. As always, thank you so much for listening. God bless and have a great week.